Here is George Stephanopoulos over the weekend trying to cross-examine um, Chris Sununu of New Hampshire, the governor who was behind Nikki Haley um, and now has said he's going to go with Team Trump. I mean, he's a Republican. And trying, I mean, we just put a montage together of the questions. And you tell me whether you think George Stephanopoulos understands the right half of America and came to this with a fair and impartial approach. Watch. Will your support for Donald Trump continue even if he's convicted? So I'm asking you about right and wrong. You think it's, you're, you're comfortable with the idea of supporting someone who's convicted on January 11th, 2021. You said that President Trump's rhetoric and actions contributed to the insurrection. So please explain, given the fact that you believe he contributed to an insurrection, how you can say we should have him back in the Oval Office. So just to sum up, you would, you would support him for president even if he was convicted in classified documents. You support him for president even though you believe he contributed to an insurrection. You support him for president even though you believe he's lying about the last election. You'd support him for president even if he's convicted in the Manhattan case. I just want to say the answer to that is yes, correct? Yeah, me and 51% of America. <laughs> what a what a wonderful clip, Megan, and Face just a demonstration it. of ABC's deep and abiding commitment to DEI <laughs> and everything it stands for by hiring a Democrat press secretary to once again anchor the news <laughs> at their broadcasting network. It's oh, amazing. it's amazing! Like he doesn't it get it. He, he doesn't get it. Like the, the right half of the country doesn't see these things as rising to the level of criminality. They haven't been treated as crimes when we've had these so-called insurrections by the Democrats challenging elections or turning over police stations, as we talked about earlier, setting them on fire, courthouses as well, all just completely ignored. They're, they're having trouble finding their outrage vein on these Trump behaviors because it's so one-sided. The doc, even the documents case, your guy did that too. Your guy did that and he took the documents when he wasn't even president, George. I will say, I don't think Sununo was all that effective in responding to it, but it was just a complete skewering by an unfair journalist. And by the way, why do Republicans keep going on these shows? Because they're you're just there to be their little- <laughs> That's a better- Right? That's a better question. Show pony. I, I don't- I don't know the answer to that question. I, I certainly wouldn't recommend it to anybody that was I was advising. Seems like Stephanopoulos has stepped on a lot of rakes lately. Yeah. By the mm -hmm. way, you had that yeah. Nancy Mace thing, right? And then now this thing. But I, I to the larger point here that he can't conceptualize, it, it, it's sort of amazing to me. I can only imagine what your information flow and your your silo of of information and socialization looks like. When you can't understand, even if you are a Trump critic and you have had a huge problem with January 6th and you didn't like any of the post-2020 stuff and you don't like him personally and you think he's offensive, but you're a conservative and you're a Republican and you're looking out at a absolutely feeble president of the United States that's running this country down to the ground domestically and abroad, mm -hmm. and you have a binary choice between the two, I don't understand why it's... It, it, from a conception standpoint, mm -hmm. like, why don't you understand? Yeah, Biden is that bad. Well, he can't get it. He's like, I talked to my friends at Soho House, and <laughs> I was at Dean and DeLuca having a coffee, and everyone said that, like, Biden's doing a great job. Like, <laughs> In the Hamptons, I don't get too. How you, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I also really love that the Protect Our Democracy coalition of Democrats and the media and the party, <laughs> like, suddenly want you as a Republican to be like, no, you know, the voters who voted for Donald Trump in this Republican primary made him the nominee. They're wrong. Yeah. You know what I mean? Right. Like, mm -hmm. it's actually profoundly undemocratic what they're hoping that they can convince some Republican talking heads to do. And also, the same crew that expressed absolutely no outrage about the fact that this White House tried to cancel all of their primaries right. and just renominate the president of the United States. Mm -hmm. Very pro-democratic position, <laughs> right? Very right. And democratic. remove Trump from the ballot in several states. Right. Very pro-democracy. Yeah, also democracy. But, but that's what you get when the internal <laughs> conversations at your network look like the internal conversations at the DNC. If you yeah. had half of that network who was Republicans, half of that network were Democrats, they would have internal fights to just to, to recenter the perspective of the way they're approaching the news. They don't have that now. There's nobody pushing back on him in the pre-meetings to say, hey, here's what half the country thinks, man. You should really approach it this way if you want to actually get real news that the middle of the country is interested in. They don't have any of that. They're, and no it's the, the same problem that they have at NPR, they have at ABC, they have at NBC, they have at CBS. There are no Republicans working at these networks. And until they get ha at least half, 
I don't think Republicans need to go on. I mean, yeah, I, I mean, I, it's I just a, guarantee a you they patted him on the back after that. They were probably doing high fives at that interview. Oh, like, yeah. You killed right. him, George. Just, just you rocked like, it. Just like, just like the press secretary in Ilhan Omar's office pats her on the back when she goes on MSNBC. It's the same, it's the same concept. It's a Democrat operation. It's not a news organization anymore. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's just a perversion of all of these shows and the way that we cover news today on a lot of these networks. Because, you know, I mean, look, you remember back in the day, Tim Russert himself, a former Democratic operative in many ways. But when he got into that sort of prosecutorial back and forth, what it was always about in his era was trying to get answers for things he felt like people were obfuscating from. Mm, right. It wasn't a partisan prosecution based on a point of view that only half of this country actually holds. Right. It was about trying to get answers on things like the Iraq War or things that were affecting this country, and he was, he was trying to just pin people down. They have taken that model of a confrontational question and answer style to you know, public officials and just layered on top of it absolute blatant bald-faced partisanship yep. as well, what give you're you, trying to get out the, of an interview. Uh, the new model of journalism. We've come a long way from Tim Russert. I give you Gail King and Charles Barkley in their now <laughs> defunct after six months show on CNN. Look at a mashup here. Like, it's so much noise coming out of D.C. How are you able to work your way through that every day? Because We can also say... He's a truth teller because when Bob Costas sat down in the seat, can I please get a close-up shot of my face? He sat down and he goes, God, that thing's getting bigger. Look, yeah. it's, get, it's getting bigger. Yeah. Hopefully it won't get so big. Now, do you ever just like, hey, you know what? Can we just talk about issues and not talk about all the, the noise and the extracurricular stuff? Yes. If you have a disagreement with a coworker mm-hmm. and they start giving you the silent treatment, how do you handle that? Personally, I, uh, you know, I respond in kind. If you give me the silent treatment, I'm going to pretend you don't exist. I hear that you get a lot of questions from people talking about smelly coworkers. You have to say something. It's just like, excuse me, but are you dealing with something? Do you have a hormonal issue? Is the water not working at your home? Something tells me, Charles. My God. This will not be the last, just saying, this will not be the last time that we're working together. Call me, Gil. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to take the under. Let me tell you a story about a guy named Leo Grillo. Leo was on a road trip and came across a Doberman. This dog was severely underweight and clearly in trouble. Leo rescued the dog and named him Delta. Sadly, Delta was just one of many animals that needed help. And this inspired Leo to start Delta Rescue, the largest no-kill, care-for-life animal sanctuary in the world. They've rescued thousands of dogs, cats, horses too from the wilderness, and they provide their animals with shelter, love, safety, a home. April marks 45 years since Leo rescued Delta. Delta Rescue relies solely on contributions to keep going. If you would like caring for these animals to be part of your legacy, speak with your estate planner because there are tax benefits here too. You can grow your estate while letting your love for animals live well into the future. Check out the estate planning tab on their website to learn more and speak with your advisor. We call dog a man's best friend for a reason. You can help those who need it most. Visit DeltaRescue.org today to learn more. DeltaRescue.org. Hey, thanks so much for watching. If you like what you just saw, hit the subscribe button for more clips and full episodes.